Let's go. Let's not get behind schedule. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Live Book Smart Sales Are Amazing. Uh, so today I'm going to show you how you can wow your friends and coworkers with sales that are smart or markdown. Oh, smart. And I hope everyone's even more excited for smart sales after Jose's keynote. I certainly am. And I was already excited. So let's go. Hi, my name is Stephen Ball. I commissioned my 10 year old for this likeness. And she says when she thinks of the internet, she thinks of purple squares. So there I am, internet man. And we don't actually have a cat, but she wanted to draw one. And of course, I am wearing my typical work from home outfit. Yay. And first off, I want to quickly say happy 10 years to Elixir. And I was lucky enough to see one of the very first talks Jose gave about Elixir at Rocky Mountain Ruby. And it was exciting then, and it's more exciting now. And it's a shame that I'm not there in person or I'd have a chance to update this photo, maybe. So happy 10 years, Elixir. All right. First off, let's go. Uh, what are we going to cover? Uh, first, we're going to recover what Livebook is. I know Jose covered it, but it's already in my talk, so we're going to get through it. Uh, then we're going to talk about what Livebook cells are, uh, then what in smart cells are specifically, then why I think they are amazing, and then the real exciting part is how to make them. And then we'll wrap up the content part, looking at some cool smart cells. Uh, hopefully, I've made them, so I think they're cool. And then I'll say thanks, so be ready for that. And then there's going to be applause, I guess, maybe, but it's remote, so I don't know, emoji clapping. So what is Livebook? Awesome. Fact. Uh, famous programmers are all saying Livebook is awesome, and you can absolutely quote that. Uh, so Livebook, actually, what is it really? It is a programming notebook. Uh, programming notebook is a code execution environment that provides a low ceremony way to write execute and share code. Uh, live books are very useful for things like documentation, prototyping, exploration, data analysis, and programming puzzles like exorcism or advent of code are really fun to do in live book and markdown. And live book, you can write Elixir code, markdown, diagrams, or lots of markdown. Like it's all marked. Oh my goodness. Sorry, I love Markdown. Uh, live books are a superset of Markdown. When you store them as a file, everything is in a single .livemd file, and it's perfect for source control or sharing, and that's awesome. So programming notebook, great. Made up of cells, and cells evaluate from top to bottom. And the types of cells we have are Elixir code cells, and again, Markdown cells, diagram cells, and smart cells. We'll get there. But first, Elixir code cells, uh, to recap, are self-contained blocks of Elixir code. They evaluate from top to bottom, and declarations persist between the cells. So if you define a variable in one cell, then it's available to all the following cells below it. If you define a module in one cell, then it's available to all the following cells, top to bottom. And markdown cells are, not surprisingly, markdown. And you can mark up text, and it's going to be formatted as HTML when rendered in Livebook. And this is great because you can write your docs right next to your executable code. And you can drop in things that make it more exciting or cool. This screenshot is from a Livebook series I've done that introduces Elixir concepts using Livebook. Uh, they're all at strangeleaflet.com. And with the new visualization features in Livebook that Jose introduced, I'm going to have to update them to be even more exciting. So good. Diagram cells are, we've seen a little bit. They have Livebook has native Mermaid JS support. You can create diagrams right next to your docs, right next to your code. Uh, and there's many diagram types. Even before the cool new features of Livebook, we've got uh, graphs, flowcharts, sequence diagrams, state diagrams, user journeys. It's fantastic. And finally, smart cells. That is why we're here. And sorry for the animations. I hope they're showing up OK remotely. But if not, uh, you can imagine what's going on. Yep. Smart cells. Uh, smart cells are a user interface that generates a hidden Elixir code cell based on the inputs from that user interface. Uh, you can peek at the generated Elixir code cell behind the smart cell anytime you like. Or you can convert a smart cell into an Elixir code cell, but it's only one way. So why are smart cells so amazing that they're the focus of an entire talk? Well, first, let me clarify why I think Livebook is awesome. 
Livebook is a web application that allows new features to be added at runtime. So if you want to process some data, output some file, build a data pipeline, when you write an Elixir cell to do those things, then they are done for everyone sharing that Livebook. And suddenly, non-Elixir programmers can productively execute Elixir, which is fantastic. So low ceremony framework for sharing code. Great. But smart cells do more. Now with smart cells, we can take the idea of Livebook further. Instead of sharing code, we can start sharing components and capabilities with nice user interfaces. And that means <clears throat> non-Elixir programmers and even non-programmers can use and modify the contents of a Livebook. And that is powerful stuff. Uh, for a non-programmer, if you want them to write an app from scratch, that's just not going to work. If To ask them to run an Elixir script, it's more doable, but not great. To use the Livebook, we've now reached with a point where it's totally doable, especially now that the Livebook app is available. But if you ask them to modify code in the Livebook, it is not going to be great. So in comes smart cells. Suddenly, everyone can use a live book and modify what it's doing to fit their needs as long as a smart cell provides that interaction. So yes, absolutely why we're here. So let's get to the good stuff. How do we do smart cells? A smart cell is three concepts. A front-end user experience, the Elixir code that translates the inputs from the user experience into generated Elixir code, and any underlying Elixir code that supports the generated Elixir code. So let's write a smart cell right here. We're going to start off writing the most absolutely basic smart cell that has no user interface and only generates this amazing Elixir code. Hi, Elixir Conf. Hello. So to start, we define a module. Done. Uh, of course, a module doesn't do anything, and we want it to do something. And a fast way for a module to do something is behaviors, and Kino is there for us. These three behaviors are what turn a module into a smart cell writing machine. Almost. Uh, smart cells have another requirement beyond the behaviors, and that's assets. Because there's a front end, we have to accommodate that. And so at the very least, smart cells require a main.js file. And you can either uh, declare it from a directory path, or you can define it inline inside the module. And for our simple example, we don't need a directory path. We can use inline, no problem. And there we go. I declare you cannot write a more minimal JavaScript file that is compliant with being a smart cell. Uh, this JavaScript does nothing but export an init function that does nothing. And JavaScript, I have foiled your plans once more. But our smart cell still not ready. Our behaviors demand some functions, and we can do those. So we'll start at the top and write a handle connect function for the Kino.js live behavior. And done. Our handle connect function accepts a context and does nothing with it except provide a return in the required format. All right, next, uh, true attributes function. And done. Our true attributes function accepts anything and returns an empty map of attributes. This is real programming. And the to source function. Uh, so this is the function that accepts the attributes from the user interface and turns them into the generated Elixir code. And in our case, this is done. Uh, we don't care about the attributes, and we're generating hard-coded code. But while this implementation works for simple code, uh, beyond a very basic case, you would never want to write your uh, two source functions with a literal string like this, because the escaping would be uh, not so fun. Instead, we can lean on quote and unquote. And Kino's got a quoted to string function. And that allows us to write Elixir nicely. And then Kino can do all the magic to turn it into whatever string it wants to keep smart cells happy. So definitely take that approach. And if we drop in our two source function, this module is now a smart cell. I hold that it's essentially the most basic smart cell you could possibly write. It is not useful, but it is very basic. And the next thing we need to do is ask Kino to register our smart cell. And when this call is executed within a live book, Kino does the work to add our smart cell into the menu of available smart cells so you can choose from it. So let's check this out. Here I'm starting off the live book environment. I've added the Kino library. 
We evaluate our smart cell module, run the code to register the smart cell, and then we can choose it from the menu, ElixirConf 2022. And when we add it, there is a smart cell there, uh, but we didn't give it a user interface, so it doesn't have one, but it does have code that we can see if we click in, there's the code, and we can evaluate it, and it works. Amazing. Yeah, but that's not really a smart cell. Where are the smarts? Let's do this. All right, let's add some interaction. Uh, we'll need to add an additional function and expand some of those original functions a little bit, but it's not too bad. So first of all, we need to give our smart cell an init function so that our smart cell can initialize with some attributes. And there. That's a little bit verbose, but the gist is that we're going to be passed some attributes and a context. And we'll use the statement from the given attributes, or we'll give a default of high elixir comp. We'll take that statement and make a map of fields. Then we'll put our fields into the context we're given with the assign call. And we'll include an optional editor key uh, in our returned data. And that tells the smart cell framework, uh, please generate an editor for us. And that editor should manipulate the statement attribute and default to the statement data we've calculated. And you might wonder how the init function is ever going to be called with attributes. Uh, well, that happens when you have a live book and you save it to a file and then you reopen it later. All the things that you've set in the smart cell are stored in the live MD file and they are restored uh, with this init function when you reopen the live, live book. So things are the way you saved them. All right, next. After our init function is handled, our connect function needs to actually handle a connection so the front end can talk to it. And that's all we got to do. Uh, what we're doing here is ensuring that the fields coming in from the connection are kept as the fields being used throughout the back end of the smart cell. And finally, our two source function uh, is not going to be hard coded anymore. We can take the statement coming from the user interface, and the change is pretty straightforward. The two source is given the attributes, and we pull out the one we care about, the only one we've made, and make our code. And that's it. We've gotten an interactive smart cell. We do the things we did before. We have Kino, we execute our module, uh, we register the smart cell, and then we can choose it from our menu. Interactive. Ooh. And see, now we've got the smart cell contents in this editor that we requested. Uh, we can change those contents, we can execute the code, and everything works. Ah, amazing. And the code has changed behind the scenes. Wow. Not bad. But, well, that's good. But it's not really showing off how to build an interactive smart cell. We kind of cheated and used the smart cell frameworks with that editor option. So, OK, let's really do this. That means we will have to write some JavaScript. Uh, let's get ready. All right, we can do it. We're professionals. This has been our main JS asset so far in our module. Happily doing nothing. Uh, genius. Well, now it's got to do something. Oh, no. OK, let's let's break this down. So on in our JavaScript side, the init function is still what we're getting. We've gotten, uh, we have two arguments, a context and a payload. They come straight from smart cells, so they're nice to work with, actually. Uh, the context is used to handle the user interface itself, as well as the communication to and from the Elixir backend with that push event, that handle event, and the handle sync. The payload is the data that we defined ourselves in our backend module. In this case, we defined a payload that has a fields attribute and a single statement attribute, so we can pull that out. And the other critical piece in our smart cell is the actual HTML text area that we're defining here in this JavaScript. And we have to give it the value from the payload. We attach a listener so that we can tell our backend about updates. And we have an update handling spot where we can update the text area when we get updates from the backend. And then, of course, there's some JavaScript magic. And we've done what we had to do. And I hope this animation is coming through because I made it for this talk. Uh, back in the smart cell module, our init function can simplify a little bit. Uh, we no longer need the editor from the smart cell framework. 
and done. Everything else in the smart cell doesn't need to change at all. It still works exactly the same. So we can check out our really real JavaScript cell. Just as before, we have Kino, we have our module, we register our new smart cell, and when we add it, we'll see a smart cell with its very own unstyled text area. Amazing. But it really works. See, it really works too. We can evaluate the code. We can check out the code. If we converted it to an Elixir code cell, that's the code that would be in it. Uh, and so from here, uh, to make a smart cell is only a matter of adding more inputs and maybe some CSS to end up with whatever user input interface your smart cell needs. Uh, but now that you understand the moving parts, I highly recommend uh, forking a smart cell that exists already when you want to make one. Pick one that has a user interface close to what you want and modify it to suit your needs. And that way you only have to do just enough JavaScript, HTML, and CSS to make things work. And uh, now uh, let's take a peek at a real smart cell, like more real than the ones that we were doing before that were just little toys. Like, uh, for example, here's the init function from my XKCD smart cell that we're going to see in a little bit. Uh, there's not really magic. Uh, you define whatever attributes that you need in order to be able to generate the Elixir code that you want your smart cell to generate. In this case, you can see that this smart cell has a concept of actions you can take, a uh, currently selected action, and a number. And here's one of the patterns from that same smart cell for the two source attribute. In this case, uh, they've chosen the number action. So we say, oh, you need the number. I know how to generate this simple Elixir code like that. That's really what it's doing. There's not really any magic. Smart cells are just this, the most clever abstraction. Like It's just awesome. Uh, but in that same smart cell, here's the main JS file. That's a different story. A lot of the smart cells you'll find that ship with the live book also have this honestly really cool view app structure that you just saw scroll by. But you can see why I recommend finding a smart cell that's close to what you want and then modifying it to fit your needs. So let's recap a little bit. A smart cell is a JavaScript front end, an Elixir module that has some Kino behaviors and some supporting Elixir code. The JavaScript front end presents the user interface with inputs that are used to set attributes that are then used to generate Elixir code. The front end also communicates to and from the back end. The smart cell module itself controls the life cycle. It talks to the front end and gets communication back and forth. It translates the attributes coming from the front end uh, into the source code of the hidden Elixir code cell. And the supporting code is the supporting code. It's either provided by the smart cell module directly or by a library that's in the smart cell package or from dependencies in the smart cell package. And let's check some out. Uh, first off, that XKCD smart cell is a real smart cell. I made it and I published it in the smart cells by SD ball package, which I had the idea that it would just be this repository of cool, but not generally useful smart cells. Uh, right now it just has one smart cell. So we'll see if that actually works out. We just add the smart cells by SD ball package. And then uh, right after installing it, we've already got the smart cell in our menu because the installation of the package also calls that Kino register call. So that's how the smart cell experience generally is. You mix install it and then you use it. So here we can add the XKCD comic smart cell. We can put in a, a pretty fun comic. Tail recursion is its own reward. Uh, we can get the latest comic, at least as of the time I recorded this video, and we can get random comics. Fun. Yay. Uh, this is the XDuck smart cell. I actually started this in my general smart cells repo, but I liked it so much I put it into it in its own repo. Uh, the smart cell uses the XDuck package, which I actually also wrote for this smart cell, and that talks to the DuckDuckGo instant answer API. And the cool things about that API are that it's one, very fast, and two, completely freely available. If you can make a Git request, uh, you can get a JSON answer back. So just like before, we can install the XDuck smart cell package. There it is. And we can ask it for something we want to know about and see what the answer engine has. Like there's details about Elixir, very cool. Something random like Kaiju. Yeah, 
You see, this API is fast. Like I've recorded this in advance, but this is all real time interactions with the API. It's really, really nice. Uh, you can even ask it for categorical lists of things, like give me all the Infocom games. Whatever it has for that topic, it's it's got several answer types that my library like turns into a reasonable markdown representation for. It's basically a Wikipedia rabbit hole generator. So that's fun. And finally, uh, I work at a company called Tanium, and we've got a lot of things, like a lot of endpoint data, but we aren't an Elixir company. So for the longest time, I haven't really had a way to bring Elixir to my job. Uh, but Livebook piqued my interest last year, and I started using it for some personal exploration and prototyping. And when Smart Sales was announced, I was hyped because that was exactly what I was looking for. With Smart Sales, I can now write my own Elixir code and abstract it away so that anyone else at the company can use the Elixir without having to worry about how it's written or even how it works. Uh, so like I said, we have a lot of endpoint data. That's machines like laptops, desktop servers. And we've got a GraphQL API gateway that allows serving up that data. So wouldn't it be awesome if there was an easy way to not only query the data, but something that handles all the GraphQL pagination and parsing? And there is. I made a smart cell. The smart cell does all the work of gathering up all the endpoint data. It allows users to just specify the, the central part of the GraphQL query, and it supplies all the boilerplate and the pagination fields and handles the pagination. So all a user has to do is run that, and they get the endpoint data in that results variable, and then they can chart it in a smart cell using this charting smart cell and easily explore the data that we've got available. So smart cells are amazing. Smart cells are amazing. They allow us to make Livebook more awesome for everyone. The more we write smart cells, the more awesome everything gets. That's right. That's it. And now I think I can stop sharing. Sure. Amazing talk. I think everyone was delighted with all the Star Wars reference. <laughs> and don't worry, your animations look uh, fine as hell. Yay, that's great. So yeah, I, I we already have questions, actually. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm back in the browser now, so I might be able to see them. Yeah, sure. In the Q&A section, uh, Francis Ridley said, do you have a, uh, do you have to have a, uh, the JS in the asset block, or you, can you import it from anywhere else? That's a good question. Uh, the JS has to be either defined in the asset block in line, or you can give it a directory that has whatever other assets you want, at least one of which has to be a main JS file. And then that main.js file can pull in JavaScript from elsewhere. Like you see a lot of in the Kino supplied smart cells that they pull in the view uh, application framework from a CDN. And it provides uh, hooks for doing that, like right out of the box. Awesome. So everything can be more clear and clean, basically, no? Yes, exactly. Like if you were to go back and look at that long scrolled main.js file, you would see at the very top, it's like CDN, CDN. importing from view. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, Richard has another question. Is it possible to modify the behind the scenes uh, Elixir code as smart cell generates to change the output, or will that require converting the smart cell into a code cell? Good question. Uh, unfortunately, it does require converting it from a smart cell to an Elixir code cell, like we saw Jose do in his keynote. Uh, you can look at the code anytime, but if you want to edit it, you have to convert it to an Elixir code cell. And at that point, you've lost the smartness. But yeah. the smartness was also just kind of a Kickstarter for whatever you wanted to do next. Amazing. I think that's all the questions that we have. And you have Excellent. a lot of uh, virtual applause. So Yay. Kudos. <laughs> Thank you Thanks, for everybody. this amazing talk. I think it will be available as a BOD. Don't worry, everyone, because I think more than one will have to recap it because yeah, <laughs> they are amazing and we need to look more at until it. Right. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Stephen. We'll be right back with the next talk.